Off of day, the Committee on Health, Land, Justice and Culture is now called to order. Today's Thursday, February 3rd, 2022, and the time is 9.03 a.m. Notices for these virtual confirmation hearings were disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on Thursday, January 27th, 2022, and again on Tuesday, February 1st, 2022. The notice was also published in the Guam Daily Post on the same days. The Zoom meeting is hosted by the legislature staff and, and I thank them for their assistance. The host of this hearing will mute all Zoom participants until called upon by the chair. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and then begin please by stating your name for record keeping purposes. We are transcribing uh, this hearing. We have two agenda items, two appointments to the Board of Social Work the first is the appointment of Diana B. Cavill to serve as a member of the Guam Board of Social Work for a term length of three years from December 9th, 2021 to December 8th, 2024. Second is the appointment of Maureen A. St. Nicholas to serve as a member NASW Guam chapter representative of the Guam Board of Social Work for a term length of three years from December 10, 2021 to December 9, 2024. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues this morning, uh, our Legislative Secretary, Senator Amanda Shelton. And we also here with us, Senator Tello Taitui. Thank you very much, colleagues, for being with us today. All right, so the two uh, nominees this morning are both current members of the Guam Board of Social Work. Uh, Ms. Cavill has been serving since July, 2019, and Ms. Nicholas serving since May, 2021. So these are reappointments to the board. Before we hear from the panel, I'd first like to read just some of the duties and the mandates in the Guam Code relative to the Guam Board of Social Work. They include that the board is responsible for the licensing by examination or by licensure transfer of applicants who are qualified to engage in the practice of social work, the renewal of licenses, the establishment and enforcement of compliance with professional standards, conduct of social workers engaged in the practice of social work and consistent with the National Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics. The enforcement of the Guam Social Work Act relating to the conduct or competence of social workers practicing in this territory, investigation of any activities related to the practice of unauthorized practice of social work, and the suspension, revocation, or restriction of licenses to engage in the practice of social work. With probable cause that an applicant or licensee has engaged in conduct prohibited by this act or a statute or rule enforced by the board, the board may issue an order directing the applicant or licensee to submit to a mental or physical examination or chemical dependency evaluation. For the purpose of this section, every applicant or licensee is considered to have consented to submit to a mental or physical examination or chemical dependency evaluation when ordered to do so in writing by the board. Objections to the admissibility of that evidence. The board is also responsible for other things, especially the administration of, um, of the licensing and, and um, evaluation of non-social work degree holders who submit a written request for exception from the requirements of social work licensure. All right, We're, we will now begin with uh, Ms. Cavill's appointment and hear from those who've signed up to testify. So we begin with the chair, the current chairperson of the Guam Board of Social Work, Angelina LaPay. Hi, <clears throat> thank you for having me. Um, Diana has uh, been on, on the board as the speaker mentioned for a couple of years now um, to fill the unexpired term of a previous member. Um, she comes to us with a lot of um, knowledge from her work in both the private and public sector. Um, during the time that she's been on the board, whenever we um, review applications, 
she's very thoughtful in um, in her 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 comments. Um, she is very mindful of the um, past decisions that we've made as a board and um, its ramifications for the new applicants that come before us. And she is just um, throughout the entire time, she gives very thoughtful and um, valid input into, into our um, considerations. So I uh, fully support her reconfirmation on the board. Um, she is a very valued member of our group. Thank you very much, Chair, Chairperson LePay. We'll now hear from Pete Menno, who is the board's treasurer. Mr. Menno. Mr. Menno, uh, I can't hear you right now. You could unmute. Hello, good morning. That's clear, thank you very much. Please proceed. Good morning. Uh, I have known Mrs. Calvo since, uh, as a colleague since 2019. Um, she is very knowledgeable, especially in, in administration. Um, she's a retired uh, administrator for public health. Um, I join in the, the chairwoman's, um, um, her recommendation that um, Ms. Calvo be recommended to to continue as a board member for the Guam Board of Social Work. That's all. Thank you very much, Mr. Menno. We could now hear from nominee um, Calvo. Diana. Good morning, speaker and senators. Half a day. My name is Diana Valetu Calvo. I am currently a board member. I am a current board member uh, for the Guam uh, Board of Social Work, and I'm here this morning on a reappointment uh, to continue my term for another three years. Um, being a member of the board has really been an opportunity for me to look at the, the details of, of the profession as well as to really have a good um, insight onto the uh, individuals that are, that are or have pursued a profession in the field of social work the backgrounds that they bring to the profession and some of the, the, inf the information and resources that also lend the board members to have further discussions about how to continue to improve the work and to support our workforce. Uh, it's been, um, I wouldn't say an enjoyable, um, um, tenure the last three years, uh, we really have been challenged with how to continue with board operations coming into a pandemic. Uh, but I think that once we figured out, you know, the te technology part of it and came out with all the different compliance, we were able to resume our work so that we are not also hindering individuals that require the license in order for them to perform their work. And one of the areas that uh, has been an interesting um, point of information for us on this particular journey is also um, learning about the scope of work that is done outside of the island of Guam, but for which the individuals being assisted are on the island of Guam. So there has been 
you know, a number of applications filed from professionals that are living in other jurisdictions, working for companies that do business on Guam, uh, including the military as well as the insurances. And so that then requires the board members to really broaden the scope of all of what is needed to be considered as we finalize our rules and regulations and then uh, build on that to really support our professional uh, licensees. Um, I thank my colleagues because I, uh, it's been also a learning experience both from our previous chair, um, Asia Ramos, and then with the leadership of um, Chairperson Angelina Lape, who really has taken us through you know, the initiation of um, board responsibilities and then into actually performing the task itself. Uh, and I thank them also for their confidence in us to be able to contribute further to the board uh, for the next three years. Thank you for this opportunity to provide at least uh, some testimony on my behalf. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Calvo. If we could now hear from nominee Maureen Senecalis, and then we will, uh, I will, in other words, hold off on the questioning of this one nominee, and we'll hear from the second nominee. I, th I think if my colleagues are like me, a lot of their questions will be for both of you. So we'll see if we can uh, make that more efficient. Uh, so Ms. Senecalis, you're, you're welcome to proceed if you have any testimony. Well, uh, thank you for having me. And I just wanted to share that I am the newest board member and it's been a privilege to um, be around the group that I'm working with, with their knowledge and their expertise and their experiences being social workers, both private and, and public. Um, I'm learning and understanding um, what the board does and, and I'm hoping I'm able to contribute and continue to work with them in contributing um, what I feel would help us in regards to our social work practice here in the island. Um, I really enjoyed working with um, the board members that I am currently working with now. Um, with Chairperson um, LePay, she's been very helpful in helping me understand um, our roles and helping us work through our rules and regulations and making it clearer for us to understand it as a community in the social work field. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from those who've also signed up to testify on your behalf, Ms. Nicholas, and we'll begin with the chair uh, of the Guam Board of Social Work, Ms. LePay. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak on Maureen's behalf. Um, as you've heard, she is our newest member. Um, she, during our regular ongoing meetings, um, she has um, shown that uh, she, she puts a lot of thoughtful consideration to the applications before us. She has um, tried to review the applications and during the time that she's reviewed it, sought um, I know I'm a supervisor, so I want to say sought supervision, but really she sought guidance on, on the process to ensure that she was reviewing it correctly, looking for the aspects that, that we as, um, as the more uh, senior board members have, um, have noted. Also, I'd like to point out that with our weekly work sessions, Maureen has been there with me um, through all of it. Uh, she... Uh, during her time as a social worker, she's worked in the um, predominantly in the private sector, more recently in, in Gov Guam, and she has a lot of um, experience as a frontline worker and advocate that she uh, brings to the table. So as we consider the rules and regs and the different aspects, we spend a lot of time um, really talking about what that would mean for um, the, our social workers, um, and, and how we can better hold people accountable for the work that we're doing for the public. Um, so I would like to say that her contributions to our work sessions have been very valuable for me um, and that 
she has been um, key in getting us to where we're at right now with it. Thank you so much, Ms. LePay, Chairperson. Um, Mr. Menno, were you also going to present testimony? Um, maybe just a, a brief one. Um, I've known um, my colleague, uh, board member, Pastor uh, Nicholas, both professionally and, and personally. Uh, she brings with her also knowledge of, of uh, some of the, like how the, the um, the law was 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 brought up, but I, I think she she told a story of um, how uh, some specific parts of the law were were, were about a certain situation, and, and she kind of clarified that for us. Um, I also joined the, the chairwoman in in recommending her her continued uh, uh, her or to continue with the board. Uh, that's all, Speaker. Thank you so much to, to both of you who've testified on behalf of both of these nominees. And of course, thank you to the nominees for accepting, uh, again, the work uh, on this board. It's a lot of work. I know you guys are in the middle of um, preparing your rules and regulations, which are really critical. You, you know, we need those rules in order to hold people accountable. We need those rules in order to establish fees for your investigations and hearings and things like that. And um, I know that at the last oversight hearing, the chairperson reported that they were about 75% complete at that time. And uh, I guess I wanted to ask the nominees what, uh, you know, how they feel that that's going and are they, you know, have they uh, we've heard that Mr. Nicholas has been very actively involved in that. I'm, I'm sure Ms. Calvo as well. But uh, so I'm glad to hear that. And uh, how do you see this, um, you know, coming to finality? Have they been referred? Have the rules been referred to the AG's office yet, and uh, for review or or not? And how do you see use of the fees? Like, how would you see prioritization of the fees based on what you've seen so far in your work on the board? Ms. Mr. Nicholas, if I could begin with you. Uh, so we're, we're still continuing to work with it, um, uh, speak, Ms. Speaker. So um, the thing that we're looking forward to is being able to look at, at the fees and how it would help us benefit in regards to how we manage our licensure office and in ensuring that we do make that effort to ensure that everyone that we are licensing is with well in an understanding of what is expected of them as they practice here in Guam. So we have really spent a lot of time to ensuring that we are clear in, in what those expectations would be um, once a person applies and to really work in, because there's different levels, we want to ensure that all levels are understanding of what it means with each license that they apply for. And we're really working on that clarity so that there shouldn't be any questions in regards to you accepting this license and applying for it. So we're, we're really working towards that as a group. I hope I answered your question. Sure, how much longer do you estimate? I guess I could ask the chair, but in your, in your work on the board, how, how much longer do you estimate it will take? Well, I think we're almost there. I mean, we, we have maybe a, a, several more pages to work through, but, I, as diligent as we've been working as a group, I think we will get there soon. Um, I'm hoping I'm not being too ambitious about it, but we really do take our time to ensure that we are not just creating something just to create it. We wanna make sure that it's something that for the long haul, it's, it's understandable for the next person that comes in. Well, I wanna thank you for your attention to detail on that. I know that the chairperson told us that you have regular meetings for those rules. Like I think they're on the weekends, right? So you're spending your weekends really working on those rules. And I really much appreciate that. They're very urgent, I think. So Ms. Calvo, would you like to add anything just in specifics to the rules? Sorry, I can't hear you right now. If you could unmute. So the process of developing policy and um, coming up with 
all of what we feel should be considered when we're developing policies so that the implementation of those policies are also not going to be a burdensome kind of activity is also part of that challenge and uh, having to um, touch base with the, the national board, you know, in terms of whatever guidance they have in the development of policy regarding credentialings, uh, the kind of education and continuing education activities and opportunities that um, individuals should be pursuing, you know, to continue to um, improve and refine their skill sets. And even how can we make those accessible on our island? And then also looking at the cost factor of some of those to ensure that um, it's not also gonna be a financial burden to the licensees to have to pay out you know, so much money, but then weigh the cost of uh, operating the license, you know, having to uh, pay even for legal services, if there is a complaint that is filed, having to do the investigation, you know, it's kind of really developing a balance between affordability, but then sufficiency of an operating budget in order to ensure that all of the things that needs to be um, paid for are paid for, you know, including small things like folders <laughs> and and copier paper, you know, because there is a a file for each licensee and there's updates and you know that kind of uh, administrative support stuff. And when we are comparing um, what the fees are on island and to other jurisdictions that may be similar to Guam, you know, and weighing it's sometimes it's difficult to gauge what would be the most affordable yet uh, sufficient amount of cost, you know, to consider. And that's, I think the other part of um, the equation is, you know, how much would it take to implement the policies and the procedures that have been developed and to be able to maintain it on a regular basis and to update it when there are updates to the field. All right, thank you for that. And I, you know, I, I wanna note from your testimony that uh, you, you know, you pointed out what I, I'm very glad to hear that, you know, your focus is also on the, the big picture of the profession itself, right? And, and the support of professionals in the field. And I, I hear, you know, now you're talking about, you know, being sensitive to the fees impacts on, on these professionals and their ability to, to continue and, and prosper, of course, and to thrive. We want them to thrive on Guam. We're in great need. And um, later on, I'm going to ask you your thoughts on um, how to, you know, foster that uh, the growth of social work professionals on Guam, but uh, if I could just get a very brief uh, update from the chair, she's offered to give us a very brief update on the rules so that uh, my colleagues will be informed. Hi, so I just wanted to share that we do, as um, the speaker pointed out, we meet every Saturday for a couple hours in the morning. Um, we are in our considerations. We've been, um, we've created a, a working document where we would um, make comments on the things that we want to bring to the legislator, legislature's attention as um, possible things that might be might might need to be revised or amended in the legislation. Um, and then we are at the very, very end of it. We've been we're now focusing on um, like disciplinary action, which is towards the very bottom of the rules and regs. Um, once we finish that, our plan is to go back and look at all the comments we've made, the things that we need to clarify. Um, and then we will be sending that to um, ASWB. They're just very patiently waiting for it. Um, the Association of Social Work Boards oversees um, regulations, regulatory bodies throughout the continental US and Canada. And so they have offered to look at our draft rules and regs as well and give us some insight on things we might have overlooked or things that might need to be strengthened. Um, and, and so once that's done, then we will um, forward it to the AG's office. But I wanna say that 
we are just at the very cusp of the, the end of that review. And so um, I think that with our concentrated efforts, we should be able to uh, transmit that to the AG within the next few months. And as far as the fees, um, Pete is our treasurer has been attending the ongoing meetings with HPLO as they are reviewing the budgets and things like that. Um, we have also reached out to NASW to kind of find out what the ballpark number of um, members they have, understanding that not all social workers are members of NASW WAM, but to kind of give us a gauge of how many people we're looking at um, as we plan our budget, right? We wanna see how many people potentially are like, would be licensed out there, what kind of fees would be realistic as Diana has pointed out um, and come up with a, a good budget that'll take us through to um, you know, the next decade or so until it takes so long to update rule, uh, fees that we wanna be mindful of um, you know, getting something that would give us a good working budget. All right, well, I appreciate that. So it's February now, February, March, April. I'm hoping by April, yeah, we will be seeing those here in the legislature. Yes. Once they're sent to the AG, if you could please inform me because I'd like to just keep track of that, how quickly they can be reviewed. I think it's very, yeah. urgent. it's really very urgent. We can't have a licensing board that doesn't have right. their own place. Okay, so I wanna thank you both again for your work uh, on, on the rules themselves and uh, just, reiterate my my you know concern that those are urgent yes um, I'm going to ask both of you do you have any continuing businesses or other interests that may present a conflict to your ability to form to perform your duties as a board member Ms. Calvo no I do not Ms. Nicholas no I don't all right thank you and does either of you have any um challenge in meeting the meeting commitments or, or the time commitment that's required of this board? Ms. Cowell? No, I don't. All right. No, I don't. Okay. Ms. Nicholas? I have none so far. You've so, so I, far. I am. Actually, yes. it's the reverse. You've, you've both been able to attend the meetings, give yes. you a talk into what's been discussed. So I want to thank you for that. Yes. Okay. Much. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, so social workers for me, of course, they're the big, uh, they're in the business of change, right? Changing people's lives, changing our island, uh, how we are doing things as well. They've been the big advocates for these social changes that are required and, and policy changes that are required. So I wanna note, I'm looking forward to the policy changes that you might be recommending. I have not received any so far, at, at least this year, yeah, I, or this term. And so I am looking forward to that and, uh, and, you know, we've discussed, uh, again, the big picture. I think I've, you've, um, I'm hoping all of you, well, you, Ms. Nicholas from Public Health, right? And you, Ms. Calvo, and the work that you do at Catholic Social Services, you're seeing on a daily basis, you guys are on the front lines, you are seeing the need that's out there, the need we have to address, the need for social workers and to help us to address those, and also the shortage of social workers that we are having, right? So we've tried, um, you know, um, to help expand that by, by uh, increasing the ability of uh, the different agencies to hire retired social workers. I know there's some excellent ones who have you know, um, agreed to come and help, especially CPS and other agencies. But uh, so we continue to authorize that. We've um, tried to you know, uh, urge UOG to focus the scholarships again on social workers, right? And uh, so that that track is, um, um, you know, advertise and really uh, shown that this is, uh, and that the jobs, the track from UOG scholarship or, you know, training or education all the way through to the, the vacancies that we have right now for social workers, that there's, there's a job track there, right? And uh, hoping to try to do other things that are necessary to, to improve our ability to recruit and retain social workers um, across the island. You know, I, I wanted to ask, um, you know, Dr. Hattori was on K57 reporting about the Homeless Coalition's count and, it, uh, and 
they she was uh, reporting some that had gotten in numbers for street homeless were much lower this year and that when they went to substandard house areas it was a very difficult for her to take in. She said she knew COVID affected people, but they weren't prepared for that. Seeing the kids sleeping under the canopy, people asking for diapers. And um, I think she even mentioned that there were, you know, a lot more elderly people in living in substandard conditions this year as well, that they were able to assess. You know, and this doesn't, it's not just on Guam, but I just wanted to know if, if you know, what role either of you or both of you think that the board can play in, um, in uh, I guess, yeah, not just policies for the social workers licensing, but policies for, you know, the government of Guam, because of your frontline work, if, if you, you know, can organize uh, your members or your licensees to, you know, um, like, like the, the National Association of Social Work often does, right? They, they, uh, they, highlight uh, policies that they think will change lives. And I just want to urge you to do the same, that if you as board members, you know, find policies that you think can help us to make quicker changes as to, you know, the effects of, of uh, people like this, like uh, what you are seeing out there on the front lines that, that you please do that, send them to us here. And I don't know if you, any of you would like to comment on that, those types of things right now, you know, what, what, what would you, um, if you have any recommendations right now, right, as to, or just from your work on the board or, or your work uh, in, in your jobs as to uh, what impact this is having on you as a social worker and on other social workers? Ms. Nicholas, would you like to begin? Uh, in actuality, uh, Ms. Speaker, I, I don't think you may have enough time when social workers get started on trying to make change, it, it tends to take a long time for us to discuss it. But I think first and foremost would be um, a cohesion of services. Um, if we could just get all social work services and agencies to kind of collaborate with one another to try and address the different issues in each different agency, because they kind of all affect one another to some extent. And if we have this cohesion, and this workability amongst each other and not where we divide and say, that's your program, that's your program. We need to collaboratively be collaborative in regards to how we meet together, every agency to discuss their concerns and maybe come up with a, an island-wide plan uh, where we can all chip in to try and work towards a goal. And if the goal is to understand homelessness on the island, I think it should encompass everyone, not just a coalition to just do the counting, to incorporate everyone else involved. And it can start from every agency. And then from there, have them develop, you know, how they can do their part in addressing the concern. And that's a short answer. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for setting me straight about the time. I totally, I, I believe you that uh, if, if, yeah, we we could dedicate huge amounts of time to to understanding these issues and 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 pinpointing how to move forward. So thank you, and I'm going to take you up on that. By the way, and so Mrs. Scavo, if you could. So, it um, as Maureen was speaking, I was trying to compare um, the, time, the, the age difference, because when I came into the field, if you will, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, I came into a department that focused a lot on um, community, direct community response. So we had a lot of people that were out in the field. We had nurses that were out in the field, social workers that were out in the field, even individuals who would be going out for things like, you know, um, communicable diseases and all of that. And over the years, um, as individuals also obtain, you know, their master graduate degrees, a lot of uh, MSWs and then 
there was a movement also to get individuals to go into providing therapeutic supports, you know, counseling, um, individual family, marriage counseling. And there was a big movement to get individuals into IMFT as well as now the LPC kind of certification. And what has been lessened then in those years uh, and even up to now is community field workers who are able to provide services out in the field on the ground. Um, even some services where, you know, they don't go and do intake and assessments out in the field. It's like, you have to come to the office. I think that um, while we have, and in the letter I wrote, I spoke about, you know, diversity of fields and the challenges of all of these. You know, when we, when COVID came in, a lot of the focus relative to housing was trying to get street homeless into um, some kind of stable housing where they had access to a toilet in order to prevent and mitigate the exposure of COVID. Individuals that lived at home, lived on arendu land or land trust properties, you know, there was already an assumption made that because they have a stationary site, you know, they should be able to weather it. But we never, we never expected that the level of poverty would be so bad that families would really be like living in an underdeveloped country, if you will, because there's areas where there was really no infrastructure, you know, there was makeshift, whatever that was found. And so sometimes when there is a peak in certain areas, we focus our, our efforts to address that, but we are not also providing some level of resources to maintain the other parts that make us whole. And so while there are there was a big attention over the last two years to house street homeless, individuals that lived or are squatting on properties and even on some houses where there's no power, there's no water because they don't have a job. Maybe they didn't have a job or maybe they had a job but lost a job. I mean, there was a lot of, of situations that was really heartbreaking because in all of those, you know, the presence of children and the presence of children when it should be a school day, then brought a lot of concerns. And Maureen was really uh, on top of it where, you know, she spoke about cohesion, but it's really kind of like everybody was uh, collaborating in a response plan because before it's, you know, everything is CPS or now there's different outreach units that are present in different departments, but sometimes it's not, uh, it's not planned and it's not uh, collaborative because their focus is on mental health or their focus is on um, employment or, you know, so there's specialty areas that are now the focus, but it's not in a generalist kind of way. So it's really, you know, the Guam Homeless Coalition will be looking at certainly the issue of housing standards and the kind of environment people were found when we did the point in time count last week. But then it also touches into other areas. And it is a bigger picture than what, you know, specifically the Guam Homeless Coalition can, can focus on. Um, but the approach, I think, um, is something that could be elevated as one of our recommendations from our pit count findings. And that is how can we really partner, have true partnerships and collaboration work with agencies because the main responders sometimes are the government agencies, but the bulk of direct work is done by nonprofit organizations or non-governmental organizations. And so sometimes there's, not also a good working relationship because some parts end only it starts eight to five and it ends at five. And others, the work really doesn't end at five. It ends 
when that individual or that family is stabilized and the crisis is is kind of you know addressed. So um, I don't want to add on to it, only to say that you know there's more complexities um, in family life. Obviously, there's also a lot more drama. I think the situation of uh, substance use and overuse both with alcohol and drugs is a contributing factor. Uh, it could be part of the main factor leading to unemployment, which then leads to evictions, which then leads to homelessness. And then that also then carries a lot of other situations associated with just being homeless. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done even in our small community, uh, but we also need to build on capacity for individuals to be, you know, like I like to do outreach and field work, um, but we need to start grooming individuals to also have that kind of passion uh, instead of kind of just being in the office also, you know, there's really all these situations uh, lend itself to various forms of intervention and treatment and response. But uh, sometimes, you know, as we get older, um, the passion is still there, but the physical limitations does not lend itself to, you know, continuing that. So we're always having to groom individuals to carry the field work and to be there, you know, and to just be there because, um, it was an eye opener, at least even for me, and I was at home base, but seeing some of the pictures that were posted and some of the situations that were relayed into home base really set, you know, the focus has to be on the whole, the whole island and not just on certain components where we think should be the focus of attention. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Calvo. And I know that's a um, really a huge statement coming from someone with your experience. Um, and I, I thought maybe you had seen everything, but apparently even you being shocked is, a, is an eye opener for us. Yeah, so thank you very much. And we will continue these discussions, uh, you know, in a, in a different type of forum, uh, like a round table, but I, I very much appreciate your thoughts on those this morning. Uh, I'm going to now open up the panel for my colleagues. So I'd like to recognize that Senator Brown has also joined us. And we have again, Senator Taitikwi and Se our Legislative Secretary, Senator Amanda Shelton. So we will begin with uh, Senator Shelton. Just Masi, Madam Chair, thank you very much to uh, the nominees today for accepting your uh, renomination to serve and for your willingness and the time that you've already spent serving. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, the the speaker uh, asked something that I I was curious about, and that was the vision that you both saw. Uh, for this position, for the body that you're serving uh, to help in uh, the face of the pandemic, how you were adapting and how you saw your role changing in that way. And I see that you both uh, are very, very thoughtful uh, in that aspect and how you are addressing uh, the work that you're doing. So I wanna say thank you for that because uh, in addition to the many responsibilities that you already have and the roles that you are uh, serving, you're uh, willing to take on uh, this additional task uh, to, to uh, put in your, your time and uh, serve your peers and the, the community. And I appreciate the advocacy that you are doing for those who are most vulnerable, uh, but also your colleagues uh, to help uh, to elevate the profession, to ensure that you are uh, giving the support that is needed for you to continue the good work that you're doing. And we know um, how essential social workers are. As the speaker said, you are on the front line addressing uh, these, these issues every day for us and bringing the information to us to help us understand the world real need in our community, the suffering that our people are facing, and to hear these stories just from uh, a couple of days ago, the point in time count um, is again uh, uh, 
bringing the reality home for us that uh, action is needed, that uh, the collaboration that you're both discussing uh, of taking a holistic approach uh, for everyone in the community, not just for you, the social workers, to address the problem, for all, but for all of us to uh, work together. And uh, I appreciate that view that you shared with us today. And I, I look forward to uh, voting in support of both of you in our next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Shelton. Senator Taitigui. Sidious Masi, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you so much for asking all those other questions, especially regards to the rules and regs. Um, and appreciate you, um, you know, all you're doing for, um, you know, this, this arena when it comes to social workers. I know you're on top of everything. A lot of the questions you've asked, um, I had questions on. But to the two nominees, you know, I'm, I'm just in awe. I've always been in awe of social workers and what you do. Uh, you have two hats on your head, you know, and both of you mentioned uh, a type of balance, you know, um, this Calville, you know, talking about a balance and, and then St. Nicholas talking about, uh, you know, affordability, you know, for them. Um, I just did, I, I have one question with the, the chairperson, though, with regards to the rules and regulations and the, as well as the two of you, but um, you're seeking the attorney general's uh, assistance after all these rules and regulations are put in place. Um, are you actually seeking their guidance while you're preparing these rules and regulations uh, to guide you through? So a lot of the, uh, any kind of mistakes that are made prior to going there, um, are they helping you, assisting you every Saturday, by the way, on top of the other workload that you have coming in on Saturdays is amazing. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Rob Weinberg is the AG who's uh, working directly with the board. He was initially attending our um, Saturday work sessions. However, I asked him not to attend it and told him that we would reach out to him as we need him um, because um, we wanted to really get through um, from the social work perspective first and then have him kind of look at it from the other aspect of it. And it was just... it. Our sessions were more productive when we did it that way. However, um, we are working through a Google Doc because we're doing this stuff remotely on Zoom. And so um, Mr. Weinberg has access to that and he reviews it. And if he notices anything, he brings it to our attention for us to discuss at the next work session. So we do have a collaboration with him before it's um, sent to the AG. Definitely they would have through Mr. Weinberg already had um, an, the opportunity to review and provide input on an ongoing basis. Well, that's good to hear. And, and it's also good to hear, Ms. Nicholas, that uh, you have a passion for law because for you to do the research, you know, so technically, Madam Chair, you do have a, another, someone in, into the law, you know, looking, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. So I thank you so much, uh, Ms. Nicholas, for that. And, and looking in those areas because uh, we definitely don't wanna get derailed on providing something as important as the rules and regs. Uh, so thank you so much. And Mrs. Calvo, when, when you brought up um, continued education, that was first and foremost, you know, the assistance of other social workers are so important. I mean, just the, their state of mind, you know, and, and the work they do every day, it, it's taxing on social workers. And I, I know that it's not just continued education, but uh, guidance and counseling for social workers are just as important. But I'm glad you brought up continued education and to incorporate that because that's very important to me as well um, as you know you move forward. And on this board, I'm, I'm sure you're going to um, continue uh, providing that assistance to the other social workers. But other than that, everything um, else has been said but I just wanted to, to thank you. Thank you both for inspiring you know, those around you and uh, for making the world a better place. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Tello. Thank you, Senator Taitigui. Senator thank Brown. You. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to ask, and certainly appreciate, I think there's no doubt we appreciate the work that, that both of you do. And certainly, Mrs. Calvo, you've been involved many years in, in, in social work and, and certainly in your current capacity that you've been doing for quite a number of years, you're 
very much been very active in, in supporting our community with, with some of the challenges that our people are dealing with. But I wanted to get your feedback. What, what do you think is a growing uh, issue? I mean, before, you know, a lot of these issues were dealt with in the family and the family support network was there to help other family members that, that may have had challenges. Uh, but now we, you know, we continue to see that there's a lot of people falling through the system. And I don't necessarily know, is it, it families that are established here, people that are moving to the island? I mean, homelessness is one example of that. But, you know, you see other issues with uh, certainly with regards to children that are falling through the cracks in our system. What, what do you what do you see? And it might not just be one one particular issue, but what, what do you see that to be as a growing problem that our people um, just don't have the skill set to be able to manage themselves, their lives, sometimes taking care of their dependents. What, what, what do you see over the years? Because you've been, you know, you've been boots to the ground, literally, so to speak, with regards to these issues in our community. Um, and I think it's, you know, we're appreciative of all the work that you do, but I see the problems continue to grow and get, get bigger out there. Uh, and then I, I also have a different view. I, I don't think government can and should be the net, you know, the net for ed, anybody and everything, because I don't, the government is not a parent. We're not a, you know, a moving body that can can reach out in the same way that uh, others can that are out there in the family structure and the community to support our other residents. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I, I don't see the problems going away. I see them getting bigger. So I want to get your thoughts and also for Ms. San Nicholas, if she could give me some of her, her feedback with regards to that. Thank so, you. So um, thank, thank you. Um, so from my, from my government career and then coming over uh, into um, social services, you know, really on the nonprofit side. Um, I can say that, you know, when I was in Gulf Guam and we were working with families, we also would refer them to agencies like Catholic Social Service, Sanctuary, um, Salvation Army, because in addition to providing some of the direct benefits of assistance, they also had case management services which were not tied into an eight to five, Monday to Friday kind of timeline. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we have been really looking at, you know, so if we're focusing on the, the social issue of homelessness and looking at what are the root causes that keeps a person homeless or that prevents them from maintaining any kind of stable housing, uh, what we're finding is that there are two major factors. One is we, we feel, and I personally feel that we have individuals who may be suffering from some kind of undiagnosed mental illness, including depression. And because they're not being seen and they refuse to be seen to be evaluated, you know, they are functioning at where they're functioning. And sometimes it's not enough to sustain uh, employment. Uh, we, we recognize that it's actually easy to get a job. The challenge is in keeping that job. And while there are a lot of barriers that is not related to the human person, you know, no car, no money for mass transit. Sometimes there's challenges with mass transit. There's no childcare. I mean, you know, there's programs that also address that, but the person, even individuals that we think may be suffering from postpartum depression, a lot of them do not wanna seek any kind of assistance, even for evaluation to uh, substantiate that maybe they are. Um, and then the use of alcohol and even drugs to, uh, as a means for addressing their stress. Uh, and we've seen that not only in individuals that are at levels of poverty, but we've also seen that with individuals who were in a career, who were working, had a profession, for whatever reason, there was an experimenting of the use of particularly drugs, um, and then they spiral downhill and eventually end up losing their job and eventually end up becoming homeless. And it's not an easy fix, if you will, to even go through substance treatment because that's the easy part of it. The aftercare is the harder part of it. 
and we don't necessarily have extended resources to check in on people, see how they're doing, provide whatever supports they need. You know, we've always discussed that crisis does not happen between eight to five. So the government really is not responsive. I mean, that would be my own personal opinion. Even when I was at GovHuam, just because the structure of a government bureaucracy doesn't lend itself to be as flexible and as open to be able to deal with people at the time they're experiencing that crisis. And if then, you know, we, a person is in that kind of situation for six months, for a year, for, you know, then they become so apathetic um, that they have no sense of, of hope really. And then accept the kind of circumstances that they're in. And so, you know, when we're going out there, uh, and even with the homeless coalition in our focus of homelessness, if people don't want to follow rules and they want to be on their own, then we let them be on their own until they're ready. It's the same thing, you know, people will not change unless they want to initiate that change. But we still need to keep tabs with them. We need to continue the communication and the interaction so that they can also trust us. And um, even, you know, and we, we ha and just to share, you know, we, at CSS, we really look at some of the profiles of our individuals because we deal with chronic uh, individuals who have chronic, um, behaviors, including being chronically homeless. And we have a, a family right now that have gone through the system, the government system, have received every kind of assistance that's available to them, has received the various housing assistance that can be made available, and they are homeless now. And so that's the, again, the beginning of another discussion what do we need to do to keep people in stable housing? Because we can help them get into housing, but we can't keep them there. Because then, you know, they don't pay the utilities, it gets disconnected, it adds a different environmental concern, especially when there's children. Um, they may end up being evicted, you know, they may have a Gura voucher, they may have any one of the vouchers that's available. Uh, they may be even assisted with uh, some kind of interim housing assist, uh, subsidies. So it's really, it's not only the provision of services, it also has to do with getting these individuals to acknowledge and to accept being helped and then the follow-up, you know, we have been following up on some of the individuals with chronic situations for five years, some of them five years. And it's kind of like, you know, uh, we have, we see progression, then something happens, you know, there is a bit of progression, but then we have to kind of get ourselves up and it's taxing on the helper. You know, we've, we've lost social workers because the stress levels were so high. They're gung-ho at the beginning, especially when, we, when they graduate from college and they're out coming out to save the world. But we're also trying to get them to understand you need to pace yourself, you need to give your time to debrief. You know, when you're working on a situation and there doesn't seem to be any movement because the other party is not cooperating there's not much we can do. And then we come back the next day and we try to start all over again. So it's a very, it's very tedious. Um, the success might not happen in the short term, you know, even within 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Uh, but there also sometimes is the issue of continuity of the resources because some government agencies change their policies in terms of the intake, the assessment. Um, as a government contractor, uh, if the government's revenues do not pan out, you know, and there's disagreements between the executive branch and the legislature 
on what the revenue projections look for look look like and then how does that translate to budgets that go to the departments at the end of the day some of those budgets then mean you know as a con government contractor i'm going to get less money for the work that i'm doing even though that the demand for services is high and so i have to determine how do i continue to do the work uh, both you know because even if we're doing it as a mission work that's catholic social services mission it still means that some part of it has to be paid for, you know, uh, staffing would be the highest part of that. And there are a lot of concerned individuals on the island who are not social workers, but we have not um, supported them also. And then if we have situations like COVID where people lost their jobs, even if they had PUA, they still wanna work. We didn't even get the high levels of volunteerism that we thought we would because people you know, couldn't be able to have a job um, and those that are not taking care of their kids. So it's, it's not an easy response, Senator Brown, because we're really also needing to pull in some of our other partners who have not been as active on the ground as they should be in order to really come up with a plan. and. And, and I speak, you know, about the Homeless Coalition because we, we, we meet regularly. And although the focus is on preventing homelessness and rehousing people, we also address a lot of the issues and barriers that contribute to those. And it's the same thing. And sometimes, you know, um, the access to those kinds of services is a barrier itself because government agencies, if they're the lead, they don't go out on the field. And with COVID, a lot of them did not go out on the field, you know, and they did work remotely, which, you know, sometimes we say, how can you be a social worker and work remotely? Most social work kind of stuff, if you're dealing with an individual, almost requires a face-to-face -face contact, you know, unless you're a counselor, but if people come in to get food, you know, there has to be some way to exchange food. And then if we ask, why are you uh, applying for food? And it's because they are homeless and, you know, sometimes the mayors don't want to give a statement that they're homeless in their village. So their benefits got cut off. And nobody is checking on this individual and they're coming in asking for food. But if we didn't ask that question, we wouldn't know that this person is homeless. You know? And then we go out on the field. So it is a lot of collaboration, um, but it's not an easy response on what is the factors because COVID has really contributed a lot to the issues already, um, but we're just needing to kind of talk about what we found on the field when we did our pit count on Thursday and Friday, uh, because it really was total substandard living. And, you know, people were living on their own family properties, some of them. And so, you know, uh, some programs are not available because you live on your own land. You may have your own house. You know, it's really up to you to develop your properties. Um, but then that's an out-of-pocket cost and people don't have that kind of money. So, you know, and we have said, yes, the government shouldn't be providing the direct services, but it hasn't changed even from like 15 years ago when I was doing the government. People rely on the government to support themselves and their families. And we have not been able to change that kind of mindset. And the reliance is greater now because there are so much monies coming out of the government agencies because of COVID. 
Yeah, but I think we can agree that's not going to last. And that, that's a concern yeah. I have. I, I'm very much mm -hmm. not of, I, I think the government has a role, not just with this issue and in, in general of, of the services we provide, but we very much okay. are, are fostering the mentality on Guam that uh, the government is ultimately going to be the caretaker, no matter what your issue is. It's somehow the government. And we have leadership that, that supports that idea because in turn, they assume they're going to get support from, from the community. And yet I think we're, we're, we're not strengthening the community to, and I, I, I know every situation can be individual, but collectively, we're really not, you know, supporting or fostering the idea of wanting people to be contributing members to society. We're very much, let's go to the fiesta and I'm going to, I'm going to take everything on the table. And that's, that's the way it is. I'm not contributing back to that. And I think that as long as we have that, that view uh, we're going to have more people that are going to be dependent and feel that that's the route to take rather than our sense of personal responsibility to help out where we can and contribute where we can. I, I, we recognize there are those with mental illnesses. There are obviously the elderly, there are children that are underage, of course, that need our support. But when I see grown adults not taking that initiative and they have the expectation of, of the system that's set up to provide this sort of safety net. If it's there, then why do I need to go out and work or, or help? And I, I, I think people that are carrying the load are getting tired. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't see a, a promising future if that's the perspective. And as you mentioned, there's some that do, of course, because of illness and other issues that cannot and maybe never will able, you know, to be productive in their own caretaking, least of all contribute back to the community. I think we understand that. But, but it's that growing view that uh, somehow someone else is going to take care of me and my family and my children rather than, you know, when we were raised, it was like, hey, you, you got to go to school, you got to get educated and, and you got to be productive. That was the expectation. And I don't see that. And that, that concerns me because I don't see that it's leading us as a community down a good road, a healthy road and a promising future when we expect the government, which, like I said, it's not a person. It's not a, it's not a caring person with arms and legs and a heart that's going to be able to coddle you. Uh, you know, there are limits to what the government can do. And as you mentioned, sometimes when revenues are short, then all of a sudden the, what we owe Catholic Social Services is behind how many payments. Right. And you guys have your own personnel and obligations to take care of. Uh, and that, that's where the concern is. I, I, I appreciate all the work that all of you do, especially you, Diane, because you've been doing it in, in different forms in the government and now in your role in Catholic social services for many, many, many years. Uh, but as you, you, know, you mentioned, we see the problem growing. And I don't know what the ultimate solution is, but I think we need even as leaders to change our perspective and how we coddle some of these issues and not encourage people to be responsible where they can be and contributing. Because we all have stress. I mean, we're probably all can be a step away from mental illness and, and financial disaster just by making a few wrong turns. Anybody can do that. And, and everybody has pressure, family, work, uh, health, you know, illness issues. I mean, we all carry our, our own load, right? And some of the loads of some of us are heavier, especially for other family members that have health, you know, pending health issues. Um, but I appreciate your insight. I, I don't know that there's a simple solution, but I, I don't like the trend of where we're going. And I don't like the trend in leadership that wants to purport to not encourage people to, to be contributing because I, I think there's more to gain from it and, and there are limits to what the government can do and hence here we are. And I hate to see young people coming up with that value system that somehow the government's gonna take care of me uh, because I, I think that's a losing proposition down the road. I appreciate your, your insight on that. I wanted to ask Mr. Nicholas a very similar question. I know you're a little younger in the process, but uh, what are your thoughts with your experience to where we're at and where can we set a better leadership direction? Because I. You know, before the families used to, I mean, when I grew up, we didn't have cell phones, but I, I mean, if I went out the, down the street, uh, a relative neighbor, you know, my parents heard about it before I got home. We had that kind of safety net and network within our own communities. Uh, and we knew it, you know, we, we knew it. Nowadays, a lot of young people don't have that. And a lot of adults that are their parents don't have that sense of responsibility sometimes for their own children to want to be, make sure their children are provided and taken care of they expect to be taken care of themselves as grown adults so i want to get your thoughts on on that and your experience okay well in, in my experience um senator is i think and i feel being more proactive in how we address situations by having every agency out there be accountable and kind of addressing the issues before they develop any further than they are um being more proactive of by providing more services out there to acknowledge that we, yes, we do have um, a drug issue here on the island 
And, and yes, there are people who are dealing with a lot of stress and being more having services where people can know where to turn to. I, I know in the field, I have a lot of people asking, where do I go in regards to what I need? And it's unfortunate our island is very limited in regards to what we can provide. And it's just really um, becoming creative. And we've had other agencies provide more than what they should because we are trying to help our, our people to get what, what they need. And it's really just looking at the bigger picture, right? We need to look at where our island's going, where we came from. Um, we did come from that, that, that time where everyone was family. If you did something wrong, so-and-so heard it, mom and dad knew it before you even came home. I came from that generation. Um, I'm not too far from what, what it was like back then, but now I see my siblings doing separate, you know? it's not the same and it's a different generation. And these are my siblings who are contributing to this, the change and the change is, it's, it's, a, it's not as familial as it used to be. So we need to just take a look at where Guam is going, um, what's the culture looking like nowadays and how we can kind of safeguard it in regards to capturing um, some of these things before they get worse. And you know, hold each agency and everyone accountable in regards to being collaborative and how we're going to address it as a whole. I mean, that's well, I, 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 I just hope we're also looking. I mean, of course, the desire is to want to want to have people grow from their experience and hopefully be able at some point to be able to take responsibility in their lives or for their children and their families and. Uh, I, I understand, like I mentioned earlier, there's some that cannot because of there might be mental issues and things of that nature that they're never going to ever be able and they may never want to integrate it back into society for whatever, for whatever reason. Um, do you see that? I mean, are, are there the success stories? What percentage would you say of the clients that you deal with that you see as a success story that, you know, I mean, everybody at some point in their lives might need that help, you know, need that helping hand to get back on track. Uh, but some I see, and, you know, I, I've also, as like you, grown up in a time where I see people becoming more and more dependent on social welfare. Uh, and that, that has, you know, the intended was to be there to help support people. But for some, they're three, four generations down, if not further. And that's the standard of living. That's the expectation. And that's how far the vision goes. And like I said, at some point, those that get up every day and go to work are getting tired of carrying the load. And there's a resentment. There's a certain degree of resentment. Uh, for those that, that simply want to continue, they know how to play the system. They play the system. I'm sure you see them. I'm sure you know them. I'm sure you can identify them uh, with the expectation that I, I'm just going to take off the table. I'm not here to contribute back to my society and I don't care. Uh, and that kind of stuff. I hate that attitude. I really do because I don't see how, I think we all have a responsibility to contribute back to our community and compared to other places, we're not perfect, but we certainly have many advantages. Others, even with never will have. And so I certainly have to see when, when that abuse happens and people take advantage of the system and, and they keep playing it. Uh, so what are, what are your views and your percentage of the work that you do that you see as success stories that you can look at and say, we've helped that individual, we've helped that family, we see them taking off to, you know, having a better future for themselves that they're driving that direction versus the expectation I to live off the government, live off the people of Guam. Well, actually, success is based on the individual and what we what they feel will be success for them. So we in my field, we just try to work with what they're willing to do for themselves. And there have been some families who actually want to improve their situation. And although it's a slow hill climbing, there is a handful of them who, who are striving to to better themselves. It's just yeah, it's a mindset in regards to the generational families who we know who are in the system. But again, that's a mindset that has been uh, taught from generation to generation, which until we can reach out to the one person in the family to want to make that change, um, change has to start with the individual themselves. So as agencies and as workers, we can only try and work with them to their best ability to want to make that change. And, and that's something we're going to have to deal with. It it's, happens all over. Um, it, it's just not, you know, here on our island, it, it seems great because our island is so small. We used to be very communal and family oriented that, you know, we're seeing the change in culture. So uh, we're being very diverse in how the people are raising children and, and the different cultures. So 
it's really trying to work with these individuals to try and strive for their change and, you know, hoping they can see it. Well, I, I certainly appreciate your insight and your interest and want to continue for both of you and Mrs. Calvo to want to continue to do the work. I, I just think, you know, what, you know, here we are at the legislature making laws left and right. And yet I think the foundation of our community uh, where the need is greatest. I'm not, not all of this can be fixed by the government. And I think that that's a wrong expectation or vision to have. And certainly maybe as we look at policy, that's something we have to look at. I know in my previous life in the legislature where we were looking at setting incremental requirements of, of, you know, people can only be dependent on the government system for so long. And then after so many years, there was an expectation that, you know, we were going to filter you out and, and you'd be able to stand on your own. And there was such a big kickback to that, such resistance, uh, because people wanted to, hey, you know, I, I, <laughs> I like it the way it is. And I don't want to change it. I want my, they referred to their, you know, if it was, if it was welfare, it was their check. That was their check. And I'm thinking, okay. And I don't have that view. I, I think, I, think I, I don't mind providing the support system, but I do have an expectation that people take personal responsibility, especially grown adults that, that don't have an excuse except their choice not to want to contribute, not to want to work, not to want to take care of their families. And for most of us that get up every day and go to work, we just can't imagine that sense of irresponsibility. So uh, it's frustrating. And, and like I said, I see the problem growing because we have a government that continues to go down that socialist road. And sometimes I think to our own detriment, we think we're helping, but we're harming more um, because instead of having that sense of personal responsibility and that expectation that if you don't perform, there's consequence to it, we continue to support the behavior that, that contributes to not a very productive community. And, and we're continuing to see the problems with the drug issues, the problems with our young children that are not, uh, you know, they're not either for school or they're not prepared you know, to take on life as an adult because they, they just haven't, uh, you know, been going to school with some consistency or had a, a guiding hand or a parent that actually was there that actually cared. And we hate to say that and think that because you can't imagine a parent that's not responsible or caring for their child. And yet that's a reality I'm sure you guys see, you know, in the work that you do every day. And it, it's amazing. I, it's, I'm dumbfounded. I mean, if it was somebody else's child I was taking care of, I couldn't want to take care of them any less because they're, they're a child that needs support, needs guidance, needs a sense of, you know, self-worth and self-esteem. And you see how so many of our young people are falling through the cracks and, and the cycle as we see continues on and on, but I don't want to belabor it any further. I appreciate the insight of both of you and the work that you continue to do and certainly will be supportive of your renomination back to the board. Thank you for, for the work that you do. With that, I, I conclude uh, Senator Tidegree, my, my questions and comments. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Senator Brown. As always, you bring a, a great insight you know, to, to a public hearing, especially when it comes to nominations and the responsibilities of boards and to, to see a different view um, but at this time, uh, we've heard from testimonies from all those who came. Uh, I'd like to thank the chairwoman for being here to testify, Ms. Uh, Angela, thank you. And of course, Mr. Pete Minow for being here uh, during the public hearing. Uh, in closing, um, I'd like to read from what the speaker wrote. Uh, and it says, uh, Ms. Calvo and Mr. Nicholas, I want to uh, commend the both of you for your years of dedication to the field of social worker. I'm sure your clients and colleagues know firsthand how many hours you put into the work that you do. It's, it isn't easy. On top of that, to accept a voluntary position while taking an oath to protect the people of Guam through the effective control and regulations of the practice of social work. It's very commendable. And so I want to sincerely thank you for your willing to serve as members of Guam Board of Social Work once more I know your experience and knowledge will be of benefit to the mission of, Guam, of the Guam Board of Social Worker, Social Work, and I, forward, I look forward to your continuing work on the board. Sijus Masi, and I too as well, and look forward to, uh, you know, in vote of your favor. So, uh, that being said, uh, this um, there's no additional uh, individuals to present further testimony, the committee will consider these appointments duly heard. Um, the, and you can continue to provide testimony if, if you want within 10 days. So at this time, we are uh, closing this uh, public hearing at 10.22 a.m. Sidus Masi, be safe and create a great day. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.